Good afternoon, everyone. All, well, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Good afternoon. On behalf of PHSO and that staff and board alike, can I start by welcoming you to today's open meeting? Uh, I say board for a reason because my name is Elizabeth Davis and I'm one of PHSO's board members. Uh, today is our second open meeting. It's a really important part of our commitment to hearing directly from people who use our services, and that's complainants and complaint handlers alike, and making sure that we learn um, from their experiences. And because it's our second meeting, it is right that you hold us to account in terms of finding out more about what's happened since that first open meeting last year. So with that in mind, we'll be starting off today hearing from PHSO's chief executive, who will talk us through really very much what's been happening over the course of the last year or so, and we'll get the event more formally started. Now, Amanda will also talk a little bit in her presentation about the plans for today and the agenda and what you can expect. Um, from my perspective, I would suggest this is a meeting of three parts. So firstly, you'll have the chance to listen and learn from our guest speakers. <coughs> Secondly, you'll have the chance to question and probe during the question and answer session. And then thirdly, you'll have the opportunity to contribute and discuss during the uh, breakout sessions that will follow. So that's kind of broadly the structure that we're gonna follow. Um, I mentioned the Q&A there. Um, I don't doubt that many of you here today have questions that you want to raise and you have points that you want to make and that is why you made the effort to come to the meeting today. So let me reassure all of you that I will make sure that, that there is the opportunity for you to make your point and be heard. You will very quickly, I think, get a sense of the range of perspectives and experiences within the room and indeed the strength of feeling within the room. And whilst today is not about discussing individual complaints, it can't be, it is absolutely vital that we hear from you and that we draw on the learning from those complaints and those experiences. Now, in addition to wanting to hear from all of you in the room, we are also giving people the opportunity to contribute online. And we're able to do that because this session and the Q&A, only up to the Q&A, is being live streamed on PHSO's YouTube channel. Um, so it, I have kind of two audiences almost kind of, I need to be mindful of, don't I, with that in mind. So in terms of being honest with those people who'll be watching us from further afar, um, they have the opportunity to submit questions as well, and I can't guarantee that I'm going to get through all of those individual questions, but I will absolutely make sure that we capture those themes and I raise those key themes with everybody in the room and indeed with the panel. So that's kind of one of the, the plans for today. And with that in mind, when you see me checking the iPad later, can I reassure you that I am not checking my emails? <laughs> Um, I am genuinely kind of looking to see what people who are watching it kind of live, as I say, are, are sharing with us. So finally, some housekeeping for you. So please bear, bear with me when I kind of have to go through this. Um, please put your phones on silent if you haven't already done so. And of course, we welcome tweeting during the event. So please use hashtag MeetPHSO. There are no scheduled fire alarms, so that means that if the alarm goes off, we do need to leave this room. The fire exits, you've got one at the back, one where most of you came through, and there's one at the left at the front of the stage here. Um, this is the bit that genuinely is quite long, so I'm going to go through this really quickly and we'll work on the basis, we'll follow the emergency coordinator. So turn left along the pavement without crossing the road, pass beyond the end of the building and wait at the bottom of cockpit steps beyond three birdcage walk, wait for further instructions, do not use the lifts or collect any personal belongings, do not re-enter the building until, until dole to do so. It's okay. So that's, that, that's the kind of plan, but as I say, there'll be plenty of people kind of leading you in the event that that happens. Uh, final bit of housekeeping, you've already got a sense of there's a photographer. Those photographs are for use on PHSO's website, in social media, and in print. If you have any concerns about that, please let the photographer know or let any of PHSO's staff know, and we will, of course, absolutely respect that. So, during the course of the afternoon, I look forward to hearing from many of you as do Rob and Amanda, who you'll be hearing from both of them during the course of the session. But to get us started, please join me in welcoming PHSO's Chief Executive, Amanda Campbell. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, Amanda Campbell, I've been the Chief Executive at the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman now for um, just over 18 months. Before that, um, I spent a long time in central government, um, mostly in the Home Office. I'm also delighted to welcome you today to PHSO's second open meeting, but the first meeting that we've held in London. And I'm delighted to see so many people in the audience here, from those whose complaints we investigate, to um, health professionals, regulators, complaint handlers, and advocacy organizations. We've got a really packed agenda with some excellent keynote speakers, including James Titcombe, a patient safety campaigner and father of Joshua, and Angela MacDonald, who is um, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs uh, Director General for Customer Services, but is also the cross-government complaints champion. After our keynote speakers, you'll hear from the Ombudsman, Rob Behrens, about how we're putting into <coughs> practice our new strategic plan. And then, as Elizabeth mentioned, you'll have the opportunity to engage with all of us in a really frank and open question and answer session. We want today's meeting to be as open and honest and interactive as it possibly can be. So please do think about the questions that you'd like to ask us. We do have a number already from online, um, but we want this to be very interactive with all of you in the room today. Towards the end of the day, we break into um, to two groups, and you have um, a badge, and it has a coloured tag on it, which uh, directs the group that you're going to go to. Um, and in those two groups, we're going to talk about two really important issues for us in PHSO. Um, the first one is um, about innovation and good practice in complaint handling. That's one group. And the second group, um, we'll talk about early and alternative dispute resolution. And both of these are really important aspects of our new strategy. So we want to talk to you about those, those things. And we want to hear your ideas about how we should develop our work um, in those two important areas for us. And all of this is part of our ongoing wish to um, engage more widely with, um, with everybody that we interact with um, as we go forward. But we also need to do that in a way that protects and preserves our independence and our impartiality. And in a way that recognises also that the, the complaints that we investigate are often seen through very different lenses, with very different views often of what went wrong and why. What I think we could all agree, though, is that our current government and health systems are under enormous pressure. And there are so many examples that we see of this every day, from issues such as Windrush, um, the cases um, in the media, and also the collapse of some recent high-profile trials, um, attracting quite a lot of criticism. Similarly, um, only in January this year, the um, accident and emergency waiting time figures um, showed record uh, levels, um, shining a light on the increasing gap between the four-hour waiting target and actual performance. And all of that continues to point to serious questions about the fragility of our current health service. So it's perhaps no surprise to anyone that Ipsos Mori's national polls, their most recent polls, found that um, about half of those polled um, found their top concern was the NHS alongside um, Brexit. So the top two concerns for this country, Brexit first, NHS close second. And that's perhaps no surprise. So it's against that background of significant pressures across the whole of our systems that it's ever more important that we learn from mistakes and that we share best practice with each other. Now, later in the day, Rob's going to talk to you um, about how we're already doing some of this um, through um, the publication of our insight reports, including the most recent report um, on mental health. And he'll also talk to you about the unique role that we have looking across both health and government systems and how we want to draw on best practice and help share that. But as a prelude to this, and to start the day, and Elizabeth mentioned, I want to talk to you a little bit about the journey that we've been on in PHSO over the last 12 months. Um, I'm going to talk about the things that have happened, both good and bad, and the impact that those things have had. And I want to share with you um, how I see our organisation evolving, um, and what we want to do in terms of being different about the service that we um, deliver. 
So most people in the room will know that PHSO has um, been through quite a lot of change over the last few years. The previous strategy opened up the service to very many more people. Um, but by making our service more accessible, we also need to acknowledge that the scale of the change that was involved presented a whole new set of challenges for us. So many more individual complainants got the justice that they needed, but in too many cases, it took us simply too long to help deliver that for them. Backlogs built up, putting huge pressure on the organisation and its staff, and that had an inevitable impact on consistency and the quality of some of the decisions that we made and the service that we were able to provide. And in responding to that impact, we found ourselves being buffeted about. It, we didn't always listen or understand quickly enough when we got something wrong. But we also allowed certain poorly hand, handled cases to reflect disproportionately on the totality of our work. Now, the quality of our processes and procedures, along with the quality of our staff who investigate these incredibly complex complaints, must be of a really high standard. And our staff also need to be confident. <coughs> confident enough to tell a big government department or an NHS trust when they've got something wrong and they haven't appropriately remedied it. But also confident enough to tell an individual who has perhaps been deeply affected by a perhaps traumatic event that what they've experienced wasn't necessarily as a result of injustice or service failure. And none of this is easy, and it can be really difficult to do that well. 18 months ago, when I came into the organisation, I found it under huge pressure. And some of it, but not all of it, was because of the circumstances I've just described. Our staff were working incredibly hard, but were not always consistently delivering to a high standard. And it was clear to me at that time that significant further change would be required to lay the foundation for a very different organisation going forward. So we set about on a programme to improve the quality and consistency of our service, whilst at the same time meeting a very demanding 24% cut in our budget. And one of the key focus areas for us to change was how long it took us to resolve cases. Complaints brought to us had waited too long to be allocated to a caseworker, and then once allocated could also take too long to be brought to a fully considered conclusion. So we've now introduced a new way of working. We've removed handoffs between caseworkers across our system, and, and we're streamlining our approach. And we're confident that this will enable us to resolve more cases more quickly. But relocating the majority of our operational business to Manchester over the past 12 months has resulted in a really difficult and unsettling period, extended period, for staff working in PHSO. But these changes needed to be made in order for us to deliver a better service going forward in the context of a significantly shrinking budget. And the majority of the changes are now complete. Our organisation is stabilising, and we can now start to make the real improvements that we want to make to the levels of our service. And our new ways of working, along with significant recruitment of new caseworkers, has meant that we've needed to develop and deliver um, a new casework training program to large numbers of staff. Over 500 training sessions have already been delivered in all aspects of casework and investigations bringing consistency and clarity of our approach. And with the support of external specialists, we've also developed a more in-depth training in evidence gathering, investigative skills, and effective communication. And having already learnt from some pilot sessions that we've conducted, we will now deliver this in-depth training to all of our caseworkers and our managers uh, across the summer period. And this level of detailed specialist training will eventually lead to groundbreaking accreditation for our most skilled caseworkers. And it is by lifting the capabilities and capacity of our staff that it will enable us to deliver the step change that we want to make in the consistency and quality of our work, <coughs> providing the service that we want to provide and that those who engage with us want to receive.
but inevitably there are trade-offs. These necessary changes, including the time we're sp spending investing in and improving the skills of our staff, have had an inevitable short-term impact on the service that we've been able to deliver, particularly given the amount of training that we are conducting. But we planned for this, and so as we finished the last financial year, um, with a number of cases that had not yet been allocated to caseworkers, we also had a detailed plan for how we were going to deal with them. Now, taking the decision to make the kinds of changes that I've described to you in the full knowledge that they would impact on service delivery was really <coughs> difficult. And to do so in the face of already very public criticism of our service was even more so. But all of the changes I've described are necessary for us to respond to the challenges of today. But what about tomorrow? Around the corner and moving inextricably towards us, are challenges and opportunities that we haven't yet begun to consider. How, for instance, are we going to grapple with the ethical issues from the increasing use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in a healthcare environment, as indicated by the Prime Minister's speech, science speech, only yesterday? How will we gauge and respond to the public trust issues in algorithms alongside clinical judgments of seasoned professionals? Reform, an independent non-party think tank, published a report earlier this year on artificial intelligence in the National Health Service. And they concluded that public safety and ethical concerns about the use of artificial intelligence should be a central matter of interest for healthcare regulators going forward. And we know that healthcare is a high-risk area where the impact of a mistake can have a profound effect on somebody's life. And we also know that artificial intelligence systems are not infallible and not free from biases. So how in future will PHSO address and deal with such fallibilities and the effects of such biases and who, not what, might be held accountable? It's vital that PHSO is equipped not only to deal with the challenges of today, but also to be configured and ready through our insight work to play our part in he helping to shape the future, both in healthcare and public services more broadly. And only if we are capable of addressing the issues of today, as well as being prepared to tackle the challenges of tomorrow, will we become the exemplary ombudsman service that we aspire to. So alongside our investment in case handling, we've also been investing in much wider aspects of our work. And that includes spending more time training our staff in areas such as equality, diversity and inclusion, on vicarious trauma, updating a range of our policies, improving our governance, our technology, our risk management and our assurance. And we've also invested heavily in preparing for the general data protection regulation which comes into force this week. Because we're an organisation that relies on information and data, and it's right that we're properly focused on ensuring that we're ready to comply with the requirements of the new regulation. And the purpose of all of these changes that I'm describing is to ensure that we can deliver an impartial, high quality and timely service. And we know that despite the incredible hard work, the capabilities and professionalism of PHSO staff, this is not going to be straightforward. But through improvements to our ways of working, we are far better placed now than we have ever been to confront and overcome these challenges. And we're better placed through the skills and capabilities of our staff. And that's how Rob and I, together with the senior team, have built a plan that we know will work and will deliver better services going forward. So over the coming months, we'll complete our investment in staff skills and training and deliver fully our new working practices leaving us better positioned to deliver consistently high quality work. And as we focus on quality, we also want to do more of this type of open engagement with all of you and, and ourselves become more influential in influencing improvements to health and government systems. In his session later uh, today, Rob will set out all the ways that we're starting to do this. But first, we'll hear from James Titcombe 
about why so many of these changes and improvements that I've described are so necessary. And as with our keynote speakers when we had an open meeting in Manchester before Christmas, we've invited speakers who have very clear views about the service that we provide and whose views are as independent as they are considered and heartfelt. And for those reasons, I expect that we may hear some things this afternoon about our service that will be difficult to hear. But from everything that you've heard me say this afternoon, I recognise why it's so important we must hear those views and consider how we're going to respond to them. And it's only by engaging in this open and honest manner that we can deliver a service that brings justice for individuals and allows us to use our knowledge and learning to drive improvement across government and health systems. And we're completely determined to do this. Thank you very much. Delighted to welcome James Tipton. Thanks very much, Thank Amanda. You. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you for the opportunity to um, come here today and share my story. Um, I'm going to share a personal story with you, um, and as Amanda was, was hinting, that there are some difficult reflections about many organisations um, in the way they responded to events that I'm about to describe to you, including the Ombudsman. Um, so I'll begin my kind of frank story. And it begins in March 2008. I'm on holiday with my wife here in Normandy. Um, that's a picture of my wife and myself and my three-and-a-half-year-old daughter at the time, Emily. And my wife is pregnant with our second child, Joshua. And we're really looking forward to, hopefully by Christmas that year, the safe arrival of um, um, a baby boy. Um, so that pregnancy went nor you know, completely normal. Um, my wife was kind of eating organic fish and being healthy, and we were really looking forward to Joshua's arrival. Now, um, this continued healthy pregnancy until about three weeks before Joshua was due, when um, on the Friday night, after a week of feeling pretty poorly with headaches and sore throats, um, <clears throat> finished work on the Friday, and on the Saturday night, my, um, my wife called me from the bathroom and said, James, I think my waters have broken. Like any strong, independent man, I panicked and rang my mum and said, um, what do I do? And she said, go to the hospital. So we went to the hospital, explained that we were feeling poorly. We were told it's probably a virus, there's a lot going on. My wife was checked over and we were sent home. No contractions the next day back to the hospital. The same thing happened. And that continued basically until the early hours of the Monday morning. And about 6 o'clock in the morning on, on, on that Monday, so about 36 hours after my wife's waters first broke, suddenly heavy contractions start. And I rushed my wife to the hospital just in time. We got there at 6 o'clock. And at 7.38 on the 27th of October, Joshua is born. Beautiful, healthy baby boy, okay? Now, about 30 minutes after this photo was taken, things started to go wrong, okay? My wife collapsed with actually what, what we now know is an infection. My wife was given fluids and antibiotics. And despite asking about Joshua, we were just told adamantly, your son's fine, it's your wife you need to worry about. But over the next 24 hours, actually, Joshua had many signs that we now know, looking back in hindsight, should have been clear indications to the staff that he had sepsis. So he was, um, had a very low temperature, he was breathing rapidly, he was mucousy, lethargic. All these are signs of sepsis that weren't picked up on by the staff. Um, I didn't realise what was happening. I actually thought a low temperature meant he couldn't have an infection. I thought, you know, uh, like in an adult, a high temperature would be a sign of infection. The bottom line is, over the next 24 hours, None of the midwives referred Joshua to a paediatrician and he was found collapsed in his cot at 24 hours of age. From then, he was transferred to Manchester, actually given world-class care. So it was almost as if his, his, his first 24 hours of life were, were very, very poor care. And then after that, world-class care, the NHS can be incredible. Transferred to Manchester, later flown by helicopter from Manchester to Newcastle, where he was given what's called e extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. I did well to say that. It's a heart and lung machine for babies. And you can see a picture of Joshua on this ECMO machine there. Basically, the blood's being pumped out of his body. 
um, re-oxygenating the blood, letting his lungs rest. And we were told this was, a, you know, he had a really good prognosis of survival, 90% survival. There was concerns about his neurological condition. But sadly, um, on the 3rd of November, while they were trying to wean him off ECMO, his lung was more damaged than anyone realised, um, and he began to bleed from his lung. That bleeding became profuse. Over the next two days, it got worse and worse, and on the 5th of November, they had no choice but to turn that ECMO machine off, and Joshua died. It was horrendous. It was absolutely horrific. Hand on heart, though, I think the hardest part of that journey is what happened next. So, very brief summary. The coroner um, in Newcastle refused to an open an inquest. He said Joshua had died of natural causes. We were advised to go down the complaints process to try and get answers, which I'll talk more, more about later in the presentation. A few weeks later, we were told um, Joshua's medical records had gone missing, so any records to this day of the time he was born to the time he collapsed have gone. They still don't exist. We were told it was a one-off by the Trust, but actually there was a cluster of serious incidents. There was actually, you know, the, the, the Trust did commission some external reviews, one of them called the Fielding Report, but it kept that review hidden because the Trust was applying for Foundation Trust status. Various investigations, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, but this is the big headline, okay? So this is the Health Service Journal in February 2012. So this is two and a half years after Joshua died. Mothers and babies still at significant risk at Morecambe Bay. This headline came about because two and a half years after Joshua's death, after various organisations didn't investigate, including the Ombudsman, we went back to the coroner in Newcastle and persuaded him to an open an inquest. The inquest took place, the findings were so serious that the regulators then went back into the trust, including Monitor, who did a review which found <coughs> 119 risks to mothers and babies that hadn't been addressed. And this was the headline that resulted from that. We then got together, myself and other families, and campaigned for an inquiry, which was very quickly supported by the government. This became known as the Kirkup Report, and the Kirkup Report was published in March 2015. The headline, really, of this report was there was a lethal mix of failures that no doubt led to the unnecessary deaths of mothers and babies. And this is the, the kind of paragraph that really resonates me, resonates with me, rather. If you go back to kind of, you know, 2001, Liam Donaldson's report, an organisation with a memory, many of you will be familiar with the, 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 the term he phrased, which was, um, to err is human, but to cover up is unforgivable. This really resonated with what was going on at Morecambe Bay, because Dr Kirkup said, you know, the repeated failure to um, examine events properly and to be open and honest with, with families was what was going on throughout this whole period of time, so from 2004 to 2012. Since then, there have been some really positive changes. I just touched briefly on what happened um, locally at the Trust. So this is the Kirkup report describing the Trust as um, its response to these events as flawed and inadequate, using words like denial and cover-up. But actually, recently, a few months ago, I went to see the new maternity unit at Morecambe Bay, um, this fantastic new building, um, and they've really changed the culture. Um, so they now have excellent systems for investigating untoward incidents. And the bit I really love is um, they have this room. That lady there is called Simone. She's not a real lady. She, she, she's a mannequin. She has a mannequin baby. And, and they, the trust now where, you know, you imagine the situation with Joshua where you had midwives that didn't know the paediatricians. They weren't working together. They now train together, they now simulate emergencies together and they debrief together and it's you know fantastic legacy really and tribute to the staff at Morecambe Bay for doing that. Quickly reflect on some recent work. So in 2016, so this is eight years after Joshua's death, I persuaded the trust to carry out a fresh investigation of Joshua's death. And people were saying, what you know, what will be the point? eight years later, but they did this investigation. And in 2016, they published a fresh summary of the investigation. And this is what it found. It found 18 recommendations that the, um, the trust you know, said, this is what is needed to prevent Joshua's death happening again, these 18 recommendations. And when they looked at those recommendations, by late 2016, the vast majority had already taken place. But when they audited when they actually took place, they found out that the m most of them were four or five years after Joshua died. And the trusts were very clear about this. They said, had we taken the opportunity at the time to do this investigation properly, it would have created, it would have prevented other babies and other mothers going through um, what, what subsequently happened. And the, the stark reality is that, that, that six babies died at Furness General Hospital after Joshua's death. 
So this is a really busy slide. I could spend two hours talking to you about this. You're going to be shocked by this. These, this is the number of different processes that actually took place after Joshua died, and I can't talk through all of them. Trust RCA that wasn't worth the paper it was written on, an external investigation that didn't interview any of the staff, it hid discrepancies from us. There was a local supervisory investigation that again hid things from us. There was a review of that supervisory investigation that said everything's okay. There was a second review of that that admitted some issues but didn't reinvestigate. The Ombudsman took a year to look at Joshua's case and this phrase we were told there wouldn't be a worthwhile outcome in doing so. There was a fielding report, which I mentioned earlier. There was an inquest. There was actually an investigation by Cumbria Police. Okay? At one point, Cumbria Police had 15 detectives working on this case. The investigation, I think, cost two and a half million pounds. It went on for, th for three years. The Ombudsman event, you know, refused to investigate the supervisory system. I appealed. It was, it was rejected. I actually legally challenged the Ombudsman, and that triggered a review that actually has changed the system of supervisory investigation across the whole of, of the maternity system. So, so changes can happen, but it took, it took a, long, a long effort. Again, I could talk to you for hours about this report into the Care Quality Commission, because they were very criticised in 2013. There were eventually four ombudsman's reports, um, three of them upheld my, my complaints. Again, I haven't got time to talk to you about them. The Morecambe Bay investigation that Bill Kirkup undertook in 2015, four NMC hearings, the last of which finished last year. This final investigation that I've just told you about that the Morecambe Bay Trust did in 2016, and my reflection really is if only that had happened to start with, how many of these other processes wouldn't have been necessary? There was a final NMC hearing in 2015. Some of you will have read the PSA report about the NMC last week. This is still rumbling on. This is nearly 10 years after Joshua died. And this is, you know, we have to inject a little bit of humour. This is what Private Eye wrote in May 2013. I won't read it. I'll just give you a moment to read, read that yourselves. Um, because it highlights how absurd this whole system was. It was crazy. Everybody was reassuring everybody else. Everybody was investigating everybody else. Nobody was doing what they needed to do. And along this journey, there were several examples of kind of false assurance. So we were told um, in 2010, after Joshua's story was in the media, around 1,200 babies are delivered safe and well at Furness General Hospital every year. Latest stats show we're one of the safest places in England to have a baby. Okay. Now, the thing about this statement is it was actually true. The latest statistics did say that, but the latest statistics didn't include Joshua because Joshua died in Newcastle. They didn't include Chester Hendrickson because Chester died in Preston. So a real powerful message about understanding what the data and how easy it is for trust to give you misleading information and how, how it's so important that you don't take that information at face value, that you understand, that you dig deeper. More comments. And what Bill said when he published the report is, all the organisations that should have been overseeing this failed to work effectively together and there was mutual reassurance. So this really important idea that it's persistent questioning, it's deep inquiry, it's expertise that's so important. And in 2014, these two gentlemen wrote a paper um, that made these very, very points that actually um, in healthcare there should be some form of independent um, body who can undertake independent patient safety investigations. And the paper made this point that in the NHS we don't have a consistent approach to investigating and learning from safety issues. This led, as many of you will know, to um, Bernard's committee, PASC, undertaking an inquiry um, that recommended that we should have a new organisation. The HCIV advisory group was set up and we now have a new organisation which I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on. I was very privileged to be part of the advisory group for HCIV and we published the report in 2016 that made some recommendations, just three of them to mention quickly. Eleven, we recommend a just culture task force. So actually we need a culture in the NHS where there isn't, um, uh, we don't blame people for human error, but we do take very quick action where there's recklessness and where there's covering up. But to get that culture right is very, very difficult and there's a lot of changes I think that are needed um, to align the system to make sure that's the case. 
a capacity building program to improve safety investigation. So last week I was at um, a big conference um, and the question was how many in the audience have been asked to undertake a serious and toward incident investigation? 90% of the people put their hand up. The next question was keep your hand up if you've received some proper training and 90% of the people took their hand down. How can we expect people to be doing proper investigations into these events if we're not even training them? And the 13 is about, actually, just as in, in 2016, the Trust went back and did a proper process of investigation that provided some reconciliation. What about all the other families who have been let down in the past? Shouldn't there be some kind of a system for these so-called historic complaints to be reviewed? And I'll talk about that in a moment. Just finishing very near the end of the, end of the presentation, really something that I think brings home all of my experience, I hope, in a very powerful way. Um, it's a story I tell very often, so apologies to anyone who's heard me tell this anecdote in the past, but it's a true, a true story. Back in 2008, it's the day of my son's funeral, okay? Uh, I walked down to the local flower shop to buy some flowers for Joshua's grave, and the lady in the flower shop looks at me and says, I hope they're for somebody special. And I explain what had happened, that I'm burying my baby son, and I tell her briefly the story. And this lady bursts into tears and she's crying and she's inconsolable. I think, oh God, what have I done? And she explains, she says to me, the reason why I'm so upset is because in 2004, I lost a baby girl at the same hospital your son was born. I'll never forget the words because she said to me, but in my case, it was just one of those things and there's nothing anybody could have done differently. Okay. Now, I stayed in touch with that lady throughout the years. And I've mentioned that in 2012, Cumbria Police started an investigation. One of the things that happened about three weeks before Joshua was born was another baby died, and the, baby, the baby's name was Alex Brady. And Alex died because in the second stages of labour, they were having problems reading the baby's heart rate. The obstetrician tried to intervene, and the, the midwives actually stopped the obstetrician intervening, and the baby died in the second stages of labour. And after Alex's death... The consultant was so angry about this that he wrote a letter. And I've got that letter here. And the key paragraphs of this letter, he says, my main concern is that making every labour and delivery normal, but we're not thinking about the lateral and possible complications. Um, you know, I'm all for having a normal natural childbirth, but not at any cost. And then he makes this last statement at the end. This has happened in our unit in the past, and I'm sure if we don't take appropriate precautions and positive steps, it's going to happen again, happen again in the future. So the police asked the question, what case was the consultant talking about? And you can see where this is going probably in the room. They traced it back to 2004, some minutes of a meeting at the Trust, where they recognised that the, the minutes said, you know, if this ever went to court, we wouldn't have a leg to stand on. And they chose not to tell that mum what had happened. They chose to tell her that it was one of those things, nothing could have happened differently. And Bill Kirkup starts his investigation report by talking about that very case. And he says the investigation that was carried out was rudimentary, protective of the midwife involved, didn't identify the shortcomings in practice. And this is the killer bit, really, and literally the killer bit, because I very much doubt I'd be standing here if events were different. If a proper investigation had been done in 2004, it would not have only reduced the likelihood of unnecessary loss of babies and mothers, it could have corrected the poor risk assessment and unsafe practice at an early stage. So I guess the message is, going back to 2009, when the Ombudsman told me there'd be no worthwhile outcome in investigating Joshua's case, we mustn't miss these opportunities. The Ombudsman mustn't miss those opportunities. But more importantly, local organisations mustn't miss opportunities to change the course of events. Human error is inevitable, but we mustn't ever allow a situation where we normalise failing to learn. So my absolute final thoughts from my experience are, I still think we need to separate complaints from serious patient safety incidents. In my ideal world, issues about serious patient safety incidents should be very rarely coming through the complaint system. There should be robust local systems, standards for investigation involving the family. And something in my mind has gone wrong if it takes a complaint about a serious patient safety incident to get that addressed. As part of that journey, I think we need to really professionalise patient safety. In the nuclear industry, there was a framework around safety. There was accredited training. It was a respected profession. In the NHS, we get anybody to do these investigations. 
I think we really, really need to, to move over the next few years into recognising patient safety expertise as a highly regarded profession with a framework around that. And the final point is about historical unaddressed complaints because I think that a, um, a system whereby a local organisation has some tools and support to go back even eight years later, as in Joshua's case, recognising that this wasn't investigated properly in the first place, a process of reconciliation and learning is still possible with the right tools and the right support. I'm going to finish my presentation there. Thank you. James, um, thank you very much for what I think we always knew would be a very thought-provoking and a very honest contribution to um, the day. I I'm so pleased you're staying for the Q&A because I was watching people's body language and I know that people will have questions that they really want to put to you later. So thank you so much for not having to, to dash off so that we can make the most of, of you being here. Um, I wonder if I can borrow from Don Bowick, who's kind of patient safety guru, really, and, and I noticed Don has said... Numbers matter, but the pursuit of safer healthcare gets its sense of urgency and meaning, not from numbers, but from the stories of human beings who fall into harm's way. Joshua's story simply cannot be ignored. Making healthcare safer is the most important medical project of our time. I'll leave that for him. Now, I'm um, particularly pleased, pleased to have the chance now to welcome Angela McDonald, who is the Director General for Customer Services at HM Revenue and Customs. Uh, health is a very significant and a really important part of what we do at PHSO, but it isn't the only part. So I'm really pleased that we have the opportunity to reflect on um, other aspects of the public sector, all of which, when you think of people who use those services, complaints have a profound impact on those using the services and require a great deal of complaint handlers working across many different sectors. So as I say, very grateful that we have the chance to hear from Angela. I think picking up on your experiences of complaint <coughs> handling, I'm no doubt reflecting on organisational culture and leadership as well, so I'm sure picking up on what, some of what we've heard from James as well. So thank you, Angela. Good afternoon. Um, it was very interesting uh, listening to James talk there that whilst the kind of complaints that I um, am responsible for leading and trying to support our, don't have many of the consequences of the kind of experience that James has. But there's an awful lot about what it is like, in my view, to be an effective organization who truly listens and understands the experiences of their customers, which I think perhaps, um, and in fact, James and I had an opportunity to talk over lunch, I think actually there's quite a lot in common um, about some of the standards and some of the expectations that perhaps we ought to think about. If you're on this, and the play the role of being an organization or and have a role in an organization which is really trying to be there to support a customer um, or a patient when things don't go right first time. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time giving you my perspective on what are some of the things that I talk to um, colleagues across government on when we're thinking about whether or not we are effective at being an organ a set of organizations that understand about complaints. So it is my experience that by the time you get to an official complaint before somebody writes, I complain, you really are at the tip of the unhappiness iceberg in your organization. People are far more likely these days to take to Twitter, to tell their friends, to be unhappy with their families than they are necessarily to write to an organization. But actually, if you were to look at more than the complaint statistics for an organization, the actual customer experience that your customers are having is actually hidden and in plain sight. You can see what is going on by the contact, by the feedback, by the repeated circling, by the number of touches that your customer will have as they go through an organization, a long time before they get perhaps to I complain. If you look at the number of complaints which make it as far as the ombudsman from organizations such as mine and HMRC or some of the other major um, processing departments such as the Department for Work and Pensions, it is tiny. But that doesn't mean that for the many millions of customers that we deal with, there aren't people for whom we are not giving a great experience. So if we look at behavior being the real indicator of somebody's unhappiness, then 
actually, how does that tie with the mission statements which you cannot move for in public or private sector, where we say the customer is at heart of our service organisation? If you look at the values, if you look at the mission views, if you look at the business plans, every organisation these days who talks about customers will say that the customer is at the heart. Those are really easy things to say, but what does that truly mean if you are really a senior leader, as I have the privilege to be, and you're looking at the effectiveness and capability of whether or not in practice this is really what is going on for your organisation? In my experience, if you really want to know what's going on in a big organisation or a small one, you go and spend time with your complaints teams. But by the time you get to a job such as mine, it's very easy, actually, to never speak to a customer ever. I am immune in many ways from seeing lots of the day-to-day -day activity which many of the thousands and thousands of frontline public service colleagues deliver. But in my view, if I'm going to be effective as a leader, actually I do spend time with my complaints teams. I do personally see and sign off complaints letters. Because actually, more than the raft of statistics that you get, the whole two inches of pack that you may get every month um, as a leader in an organisation, truly going and listening on the phone, understanding and speaking to customers about their complaints will be often some of the best insight that you will get to what really is the customer experience um, of what you're actually getting. But I wanted to share a few thoughts with you about when you go and visit that complaints team, what might be some of the things that perhaps you might look out for when deciding whether or not you really are focusing on it? So the first question I'd like to challenge if you go and sit in your complaints team is, who's in the team? In some organisations I have been a part of in the past, people who end up in complaints teams are the people who couldn't quite hack it in other places. The people who perhaps have not got very long to wait before they are going to retire, people for whom actually the organisation goes, I'm not very certain about that, we'll put you into complaints. Now that's massively disappointing and terribly dispiriting and disrespectful to any of the colleagues who are in there, but do sometimes there is an interesting question about how do we select who it is that we need to put into our complaints teams? Because by the time the customer gets as far as complaining, bearing in mind I said to you earlier that complaining is the tip of the unhappiness iceberg, by the time a customer gets as far as complaining, they've probably been in contact with your organisation many, many times. Often some of the most complicated and difficult circumstances are in those cases that end up in your complaints team. So actually those people who you have in your complaints team should be some of the most gifted and capable people that your organisation possesses. Ideally you should aspire after a long career in serving customers to end up in complaints. Because it is in that team where you will have the opportunity to help customers where perhaps that customer is bounced around the organisation and there is only you left to really try to help and support them. So your skill and ability to communicate well, your knowledge of whatever is the technical area that you are um, running as part of your organisation, whether it's tax or housing or whatever that might be, the people who are in that team should be the best and most shining example of the skills and capabilities of customer handling that your organisation possesses. The next big interesting question to ask colleagues, and I often find that people who are in those teams are often in there for a very long time because they've got some real capability and skills, is to ask them whether or not they're still seeing the same complaints that they are seeing today that they saw 12 months ago, two years ago, three years ago? Are we still seeing the same themes? Are there still the same issues which are coming up? Because even if the volume has got smaller, the fact that you are seeing pretty much the same kind of issues challenging through your organisation really mean you need to challenge yourselves about whether or not you're really listening to what's going on or whether actually what you're doing is working hard to effectively manage a complaints process. Because things which turn up again and again, which are not being addressed, tell me that there is something systemic in the organisation which isn't being sorted. Next question is how often anybody comes to visit them. Complaint statistics 
go into that pack, that two-inch pack of stats that tell the senior leaders of an organisation what's going on. But whether or not the chief exec regularly drops by, asks for a phone call, whether the senior leader of that organisation is interested in what the complaints teams have to say, those things are an incredibly important part of whether or not, again, I am an organisation who puts the customer at the heart, or whether genuinely I am interested in what it is that that customer group, those customer champions, really have to say and really have to tell me, reflecting back to me about what really is going on in my organisation. And finally, do they believe they are superheroes? Now, it might sound like quite emotional language, but in my experience, and I said to you earlier, by the time the customer gets to these people who are in the complaints team, lots and lots of stuff will have happened for that particular customer. And usually, the people who were earlier on in the process were often working very hard to do what they thought was the right thing. And by following whatever were the strict processes and the rules, the strict criteria, which didn't necessarily take account of the individual customer circumstances, or perhaps apply some empathy and some reality and some human discretion to the circumstance, that customer has got bounced around. So those people in that complaints team, as well as being confident and capable, also need to believe that actually if the rules need slightly bending, if there needs to be a bit of the right conversation, if there needs to be some challenge, that they feel, really feel that the organisation empowers them to do that. Otherwise, they are simply driving a process in line with a whole load of other people who are driving a process inside the organisation. And if you aren't able to do that, then those customers will feel that that organisation can't help them and they will end up in the many layers of escalation. The layers of adjudicators, eventually the layers of the ombudsman. Now, by the time an HMRC customer gets to Rob, They've been through at least three layers of official complaint by the time they get there, never mind whatever was the first set of bouncing around that they may have gone through. And I don't think HMRC is unusual. Many of us have many layers of complaints that um, customers can be supported through. And when I talk to my first line complaint handlers on the cases that do eventually make it as far as the ombudsman, and I say, actually, the Ombudsman has recommended something that isn't enormous. We could have done that at the first instance. Why didn't you do it? The challenge is often, I didn't feel I could. I didn't feel I had the power to be able to say the thing, make the adjustment, make the change. Now, those influences, those permissions, come from leaders like me setting out what we think is the right approach to dealing with customers. So when I talk to my teams, when I'm definitely when I'm talking across government, I think that one of the main challenges that we need to be really careful about in terms of managing what is a great complaint service is I think we need to be really honest and open with ourselves that actually we won't always make all complaining people content with the outcome. We will always be circumstances where there are differences of view about what could have been done, what should have been done, what is the right outcome, what is the right redress as a consequence. But regardless of the outcome, regardless of whatever is the final decision, as an organisation who believes that they put the customer at the heart, no matter what is the circumstance, no matter how difficult and challenging, it is my view that actually all customers need to be listened to, treated with dignity and respect. Now that can be very challenging when emotions run high and often some very difficult exchanges can take place. And that is where it's really important that as leaders in any of these organisations we provide the right training and support, but we're also there to encourage um, when often some very difficult conversations can be taking place in some very emotional circumstances. But dignity and respect on both sides is, in my experience, by far what most people are looking for. They may not like the answer, but at least they may want to feel listened to by the time we get to the other end of it. I think the other thing that I also want to really challenge is that if the only view that we have about the success or failure of our organisations is in the volume of complaints we have, we really are missing the point. And I really would urge any organisation not to set themselves a complaints reduction target. 
Now, that doesn't mean that I want to, don't want to lead an organisation that makes less people unhappy. But actually, if all you do is look at your complaints numbers in that iceberg I mentioned, you are missing a whole group of customers for whom actually they really do need help and support further back. And if you set an organisation a complaints reduction target, as opposed to a can we serve our customers better objective, then actually what we re all will do is drive the numbers underground. Are we really making sure that in a really positive and an open and encouraging way, we really do understand what it is like to be a customer of this organisation? And how do we make sure that we've got the whole range of indicators, both from a human contact perspective, but also the statistics that tell us what's going on? So lots of complaints is good in an, in an odd kind of a way. Because what that is showing is an, an environment where you are, your customers feel that it's okay to give you feedback and for you to really understand. Lots of the same complaints year after year, that's not a good outcome. And finally, put your best and most experienced people in your complaints team. Those are the people who should really tell you what's going on, who should really challenge you, who should be your superheroes, the people who are right for your customer. Because actually, it is your ability to communicate well that makes the fundamental difference. So many times things become difficult because of miscommunication, people not understanding what was needed, people not feeling like they were listened to, and I mean communication in a two-way um, two way, way. So if you have your most brilliant colleagues in those teams, then whilst I would, it would be wonderful in if all the organisations across government, we didn't make mistakes in the first place. What we should be doing when things get difficult and where there are problems, our absolute obligation is to fix them right first time, be open and honest about what is going on, apologise when is needed, but certainly to empathise and to listen and to behave and treat people as we would like to be treated ourselves. So I hope that gives you some insight into my view. It's certainly a lot of conversations that we are having across government. I think there is certainly more for us to do. Um, we are making good progress. But an effective environment across government is about more than what the Ombudsman does. It's about how all the organisations in government set high standards, focus on the customer first, and really follow that through from word through to action. Thank you very much. Angela, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, the online responses to kind of you redefining really what it means to kind of put the customer at the heart of any organisation were really coming, coming through. And when you talked about the three layers of official complaints, by the time something even gets the Ombudsman, that iceberg analogy, again, lots of responses to that kind of quite sort of sobering moment in terms of just thinking through th those different layers. Um, so I, I don't doubt, it, again, that there'll be an opportunity to kind of come back and ask some more questions about that. And again, I'm really delighted that Angela is able to stay with us for, for the Q&A. Um, so you've had your chance to hear from the guest speakers. There's now an opportunity to have a little bit of kind of reflective time, uh, aided by tea and coffee. Can I just check as well, is it just me or is this room really cold? Yeah. Yeah. This room is really cold, right? So on a practical level, well, let, let's get that sorted because actually it's not entirely conducive, is it, I think, to kind of continuing to listen. Can I maybe pick up on a few more practicalities before I let you kind of head off and get something um, warm? Um, so um, just a reminder for anyone who needs it, the accessible toilets, please use this entrance, um, this exit at, at, at the front because then you'll be able to, to access those. Similarly, if you need to use the lift, then please use um, this exit here at the front. The lift is quite small, so can I ask that maybe those with specific mobility issues um, use the lift and, and others, if they can use the stairs, I think that would be appreciated. Please start making your way back to this room, um, sort of 10 to around 5 to. It always takes much longer than you think, doesn't it, in terms of coming back. And that's when we'll be returning for the Ombudsman address and a Q&A session. Uh, just before all you head off, I need to show respect to colleagues who are uh, viewing remotely. And that's just for those watching live stream, a reminder that you can submit questions via slido.com. 
Um, you'll need the event code, which is hashtag 3448, and there are very simple online instructions to use. A number of you are already doing that, for which I'm very grateful, but just a reminder for anybody else who hasn't yet submitted any thoughts or uh, questions. So thank you very much all. You will return, um, as I say, to a warmer room, I hope. Uh, but thank you very much so far. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you very much for rejoining us. That's an incredibly quick 15, 20 minutes, isn't it? It always is kind of when it kind of comes in the middle of a session. I am assured that the heating has been turned up and the air conditioning has been turned down. I think there's a slight microclimate going on. Apparently, it's colder at the front and warmer at the back. Uh, but hopefully, things will sort of start to get a little bit warmer for colleagues at the front during the course of this next session. So we're starting to move now to the second stage, if you like, of that three-parter I talked about at the beginning. I was reflecting on how, at our first open meeting in Manchester in December, there was lots of talk about what PHSO will do in the future. And actually, there were lots of we will statements, particularly from Rob. Since that time, the new strategy has been published, and so now is the stage at which we're moving beyond personal commitments from the Ombudsman to hearing about hard and fast organisational commitments, which must be delivered and are being delivered, and they need to be plans for the future about how they'll continue to be delivered. So it's very much with a view to hearing more about that. Could you please join me in welcoming Rob Behrens, PHSO, from the <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, this is really the anniversary of my first year in post, uh, which has been a character building experience. I want to thank you for your courtesy and your engagement. Um, there have been many highlights, um, but today Angela <coughs> McDonald said, put your best people in your complaints team. And I want to remind you that today is the anniversary of the bombing of the Manchester Arena. And our office in Manchester is very close by. And it was locked down for several hours on the day of the bomb and the day afterwards. And many colleagues showed great character and courage in staying calm when they were under direct threat. And even more remarkably, they made every effort to get into work the following day when the transport system was completely disrupted um, by uh, the bombing. That is the kind of commitment which uh, I'm proud to be associated with and which we need to continue to show if we're going to turn our organization round. Now, the publication of our new three-year uh, strategy uh, took place just a few weeks ago, and it marked a, an end, but also a beginning. It was the end of an intense and difficult period of self-reflection and listening to criticism, most of it legitimate. It was the turning over of a page, having fully digested what had gone before. And it was the beginning of a new phase in our history in which we seek to return to the core values of an ombudsman service. Competent in resolving complaints, transparent in everything that we do, and working in partnership with bodies in jurisdiction, many of whom are here today, stakeholders and complainants to engineer better practice in the health services and the wider public service. Uh, I note that Bernard Jenkin, the chair of uh, the Public Administration and Constitutional uh, Affairs Select Committee is with us today. I thank him for his attendance again. In their annual review of the Ombudsman Service, the Select Committee uh, said a few weeks ago that they were cautiously optimistic that we are now on the right lines, but that it still takes too long to resolve cases 
and there are many issues still to be addressed. They wondered why I had said that the new strategic plan was modest and relatively simple in scope, but that Amanda Campbell, our excellent chief executive, had said that it were, would be very difficult to deliver. Both statements are true, and there are three big reasons uh, why they are entirely compatible and why, despite making progress, there is no room for complacency about delivering the planned outcomes of the new plan. First, as you've heard from James Titcomb, there are big historic legacies which have undermined public trust in our service, and these are not easily remedied. Second, whatever it sets out to do, in law and in culture and in practice, the Ombudsman must be independent and impartial between competing parties. And third, despite our long history, now 51 years, there is no Ombudsman golden age I've looked to refer to, and there's certainly no blueprint for exactly how national Ombudsman schemes should operate. I want to deal first with the historic legacies. James Titcomb's account today, just as he set out in his wonderful book, illustrates that this organisation, PHSO, at a critical time, failed to recognise that systemic abuses were being perpetrated by nurses and midwives, and that this led to tragic and avoidable deaths which should have been investigated earlier. In a remarkable piece of public service, James has channeled his experience to campaign tirelessly and effectively for patient safety, and we are all in his debt for this. What we have learned from this and many cases like it is that we have to speak truth unto power, and that in order to do so, the Ombudsman has to reinvent our investigation skills through significant investment in people, training, policy development, and forms of resolution, including early resolution and mediation, to complement adjudication. Our strategy sets out a roadmap for doing just that. At the same time of raising our game, we need to engage continuously with all our stakeholders to learn from them, to demystify our processes, and to restore trust and confidence over time. That is why I have visited trusts up and down the country and seen firsthand the remarkable work that goes on in our hospitals and the pressure that NHS staff and clinicians are under. That is why I've introduced open meetings. That is why Radio Ombudsman is up and running and James was a guest today. And that is why our strategic plan commits to the publication of almost all our casework and the infusion, the infusion of user perspectives into our governance arrangements. When Baroness O'Neill argued in her important Reef lectures that transparency was an overrated concept in the restoration of public trust, I respectfully disagreed. Everything I have learnt in my year at PHSO tells me that transparency is a critical ingredient of restoring public trust. I want to turn at this point to the complaints raised by James at the end of his talk because, as he rightly says, there is a small number of complaints that are part of the legacy which have not been satisfactorily resolved. I have met with a large number of complainants who have not been satisfied with the handling of their complaints. I promised that their cases would be looked at again and by people not involved in the previous investigations. This has now happened in more than two dozen cases 
and there is a small number still to be completed. I will be writing to Bernard Jenkins and to the Secretary of State for Health with a report on what we have found in these cases. In one case, I have quashed the original decision after some thought, and in several others, I have identified and found serious failings of service delivery. There remain a very small number still to look at, but I agree with James that there has to be a way of looking at historic cases without necessarily involving the Ombudsman. And I agree that there needs to be truth, justice and reconciliation in this respect. Second, I want to deal with the challenge of being independent. Our strategic plan is rooted in four core values that we have to live by. Independence, fairness, excellence and transparency. All of them are vital if we are to live up to our experience of being ombudsman. But none of them mean anything unless we are independent. Because you cannot be an ombudsman without being independent. We have to be impartial between bodies in jurisdiction and complainants. So that means, and clearly, we are not the people's champion. But at the same time, and this is an ambiguity that needs to be explored, at the same time we need to recognise the imbalance in power relationships between institutions on the one hand and complainants on the other. And on a daily basis, we have to significantly improve our interactions with people who are bereaved, traumatised, grieving, or just plain angry uh, w as a result of the complaints that they bring. As part of our strategic plan, as Amanda has noted, we are providing unprecedented corporate training and guidance to every case handler in the organisation, not only on the core elements of investigation, but also on communication skills and dealing with trauma. We are now committed to face-to-face -face meeting with every complainant who believes this to be important. As Scott Morris said memorably at our last open meeting, we can't continue with a situation where PHSO case handlers are traumatised by being unable to deal with the trauma of complainants. That is a commitment and we will deal with it. And in dealing with the core values of independence, I need to add one final point. We will continue to draw on independent expertise to help us resolve complex cases, as we have done by the distinguished contribution of Dr. Bill Kirkup. We will respect the strongly held view of complainants, including the knowledge they have built up of their own cases. The complaint is clearly theirs, but the decision, properly evidenced and faithful to due process, must belong to the Ombudsman, and that must be something which is clear to all who come to us. I now want to deal with the issue that there's been no golden age or blueprint for ombudsmen to follow. I note in passing that we're lucky today to be joined, I didn't know this until the break, by the ombudsman of Zambia. Could you identify yourself, please? And could you give her a round of applause? You are warmly welcome to the network of ombudsmen throughout the world that we're now uh, absolutely part of. In the 50-year history of the ombudsman service in the UK, there have been many notable successes for citizens' rights over insensitive public administration. And each ombudsman, and I am the 10th, has set out to perform useful public service with some being more successful than others. But there is no golden age to refer to because the world of public and health service management continually changes, so methods become outdated. 
The Wyatt Report of 1961, which launched the Ombudsman idea in the UK, was a landmark document. But read it today and you'll see it's riddled with undue deference towards Parliament and government departments. Also, it wasn't until 1995 that the Ombudsman was able to look at clinical judgments, and this has considerably widened the scope of investigations and our responsibility. And most of my predecessors did not have to deal with the revolution in public expectations about public service delivery and the happy decline of deference. People speak to me without deference, that's exactly as it should be. None of this is an excuse, but rather a challenge calling for leadership and innovation, and that has to come throughout our organisation. First, our new strategic plan recognises the importance of us working closely with the new, soon-to-be legislative body, the Health and Safety Investigation Branch, which Bernard Jenkin has done so much to bring forward. It will provide an institutional focus for patient safety investigations. Is safe space for investigations in hospital genuinely achievable, or is the defensiveness in the health service too entrenched? That's a question for all of us, not just for those engaged in patient safety. Secondly, and related, I have now commissioned under the plan a much-needed review of the way in which the Ombudsman receives and uses clinical advice following constructive criticism from the Patients' Association that this advice doesn't always carry complainant confidence. I accept this, and the importance of accepting it was underlined by a recent Court of Appeal case which criticised clinical advice we had received uh, in 2012. And I will shortly be announcing the name of a leading independent clinician to advise us on reforms, and we will be calling for your uh, contributions as users and stakeholders. Third, a new feature of our work under the plan will be the assistance we give to bodies in jurisdiction, public bodies, not just hospitals and trusts, towards improving their own complaints handling procedures. We can't do this on our own. I'm grateful to uh, Angela MacDonald for her contribution today. She hosts a crucially important government-wide network which is the repository of good complaints handling practice. And this will be a vital ally in moving forward and publicizing not just poor practice, but good practice which undoubtedly exists across the public service. But I have to say that my experience of talking to hard-pressed complaints handlers in hospitals, and it's now quite extensive, is that they tell me that they lack the seniority, the status, the skills, or the resources to address complaints effectively at their source. This is not a criticism of those individuals. It's a structural reality. And it makes sense for us to assist when we receive over 100,000 calls a year from citizens complaining against frontline institutions without having yet exhausted their processes. Fourthly, as I mentioned earlier, and under the strategic plan, we need to reform our governance, even if we are restrained by the 1967 legislation in what we can do. We need to ensure that there is a continuous user perspective in all our governance debates. We have much to learn from sister organisations in this respect. And one of the successes of the last year has been PHSO's reintegration into the Ombudsman community in the UK and internationally, where there is so much free learning about good Ombudsman practice. We're going to use that to improve our governance arrangement. Fifthly, 
while respecting the political reality of Brexit, that there's no early opportunity for legislation to bring PHSO and the local government and social care ombudsman service together. Mick King is here today. Thank you, Mick. There is a need to begin evidence-based campaigning for new legislation which will put a new unified ombudsman on a par with European counterparts who have the power to investigate in special circumstances where there is no complaint from an individual. And the importance of this power is illustrated by our recent insight reports on policy and strategic issues, which are an essential part of our armory. Our insight reports show that in certain sections of our citizenry, elderly people in hospital, people suffering from mental health illnesses, whistleblowers in public services across the country, there is a need for investigation of abuses, but a reluctance or an inability of citizens to complain. The power of what is called own investigation is routine throughout Europe, and I do not see why UK citizens should be disadvantaged by not having it. I want to conclude by saying that all that I have said may be common sense and unspectacular, but none of it is easy to deliver. I know that previously PHSO has suffered from an optimism bias in which, for example, because the organisation had a strategic plan, then that plan, by its existence, must be delivering successfully. Plans can go wrong. Our new plan might, but this is not the Soviet Union. And when it goes wrong, we will admit it and do something about it. The challenge is to return to the basics of an ombudsman service, where the first task, the primary task, is to resolve equitably complaints as a, the handler of last resort. And to do this, we have to invest continuously in our own case handling expertise and engagement with you as stakeholders and complainants. We will not always agree, and there is no reason why we should, but the point of a dialogue or a conversation is to understand better your conversance point of view and therefore to enrich the engagement with respect and understanding. That is why we are together today. Thank you for coming. very much indeed for that. Um, you will recognise some familiar faces on the stage, but there is a slightly newer face for some of you there. Can I take the opportunity to welcome Bernard Jenkins, MP, who's joined us. Uh, Bernard's had a number of name checks, hasn't he, actually, during the course of the day, but Bernard chairs the um, Constitutional, um, sorry, forgive me, the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, otherwise referred to as PACAC. Um, Bernard, therefore, has a key role, his committee has a key role in terms of holding PHSO to account, but similarly has a key role in actually supporting PHSO's work using that insight to hold public services to account in turn. So thank you very much for, for joining us, Bernard. Um, we move now all on to the question and answer session, and I really want us to make the most of our time together. We've got just under an hour. I kind of warned you earlier today, didn't I? This time inevitably goes very quickly. Um, with time in mind, we referred earlier to the fact that at 2.30, um, we're very keen that we observe the minute silence um, to honour the um, Manchester uh, Arena attack. It's coming up to 25, but it's just gone 25 past now. So what will happen is, and, and forgive me if I'll try and kind of do introductions, if you're speaking at half past, I will interrupt you, just ask you to stop, and then we'll let everyone know when the minute starts, and then we'll let you know when it finishes. So we'll kind of respect it, but in a way that's hopefully not too disruptive to the flow of the session that we want to have together. <coughs> so if I can just flag that up with looking um, at time. Um, I started today with some general housekeeping, didn't I? So let's move now to um, some Q&A housekeeping. Um, so firstly, if I can just say to all of you here, um, time will creep up on us, so please help me in terms of keeping to time. So if 
you can keep those questions, those points as succinct as you can, so that we genuinely have time to actually hear the responses from the panel, that would be appreciated. Um, again, with time in mind, I know that you will have heard stuff during the course of the day that you don't necessarily agree with. You might hear other people putting questions you don't agree with. If you're frustrated, please be patient. I will get to you. We will get the microphone to you, and you will have the opportunity to make your point. Please wait for the microphone. Resist that natural urge. We all have sometimes to kind of speak over somebody else if we're kind of not agreeing with them. But please wait and be patient, and we'll get to you. Oh. Thank you all. Is that you, I think you were all looking at me really patiently then, or kind of people at the front were probably hearing, people at the back um, less so. Um, but we have a range of people in the room today, as I say, and online, so I need to kind of try and bring in that blend of people, that blend of experiences as much as I can. And finally, can you just introduce yourself so we know where you fit in and, and why you came here today? That would be helpful. <coughs> Um, can I maybe then come back to the panel, some housekeeping for you. So the first and most obvious one for me to do is say, please answer the questions. Um, if I think you haven't, I'm actually going to come back to you. My job right now for the next uh, hour is not as a PHSO board member, but is to make sure that everybody in this room gets the most that they possibly can from this session. Um, some of the questions might be difficult to answer, some might be uncomfortable, some might be a work in progress, but we need to go back to the founding principles of today, honesty and transparency. That's what this day is about. Um, and can I say that message is as important for James, Angela and Bernard as it is for Rob and Amanda. A number of the questions are quite specific to PHSO. I've seen what's coming in online, but your broader perspectives are really valuable and we do want to hear from them as well. So, um, in terms of how we're going to use our time, in the original invitation, um, you may remember that you were asked whether anyone was interested in pre-submitting some questions. A number of you have done that, so I'll come to you just to get things started. With that in mind, to help with microphones, can I just check, is Stephen Greck here? He's just left. He's just left, okay. I can maybe do Stephen's question on his behalf, because I think it's, it, it, it's a valid question. What about Diane McKee? Diane, thank you. So if we can just kind of make sure somebody spotted down with the microphone. And Ashley Armstrong? <coughs> no? Oh, okay. So we've got Ashley there. So if we can just kind of bear that in mind, I'll be coming to you. Um, so we'll start by hearing from you, bring the panel in, then we might finish with some quick fire uh, questions, as I say, just to kind of make sure that everybody has the opportunity to say things. Um, my challenge throughout is going to be to draw links with what people are saying online as well. But I'll very much do that. And can I just do a final heads up to Rob and Bernard? I'll be coming back to you at the end. We are approaching half past two, everyone. So can I please ask that we observe a minute's silence? Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we are grateful that you've been so willing to respect that. Let's get us started then. As I say, so unfortunately, we've, we've just missed Stephen. Uh, Stephen kind of had an important question that goes to the heart of an, a number of themes, and it, it gives us a chance to start with the, the wider complaints landscape before we focus perhaps on PHSA. So the point that Stephen was going to make is that ADR, Alternative Dispute Re Resolution, requires knowledge of the law. There is no advocacy for the complainant, no help with legal fees, but the organisations in question have unlimited legal aid. Bias against the complainant is prevalent and not given a 50-50 chance on their complaints. I think the two points that Stephen is drawing out in that question are firstly with regard to the power imbalance and how that is addressed, and secondly, 
with regard to bias. And again, I've got some questions to draw in with regard to bias. But I'd be interested in hearing James and Angela's thoughts on that, because you, you both alluded to this, this challenge and what you do to address it. James, do you want to go first? So, yeah, a few, a few, few, few principles, really. One, uh, back to my point about separating yeah. complaints from serious incidents and, and a vital component of that, you know, this is a safety event. A vital yeah. component of that is independence. How can you expect the organisation to investigate a serious patient safety event about itself? So part of the standards, I think, should be that trusts use independence. And the other part of this is um, um, advocacy. And actually, there is a role, I think, for patients, especially with complex complaints, to have much better local advocacy support. There are organisations like AFMA, Action Against Medical Accidents, that can provide help. Um, there are PALS, but I think we really need to improve the, the advocacy that, that people have access to. Yeah, thank you, James. Can I just check, have we got the advocacy organisations here today? Yes, I kind of saw some on the list. So again, if you have thoughts about this and do you want to come in, you'd be very welcome to, to do so. So just kind of catch my eye. Angela, what about from, from your perspective? Yeah, I think that I think part of the challenge for organisations is about um, how they choose to communicate. So if you're speaking the language which a, the, a normal person can understand, then actually, um, even though there may be some legal aspects to whatever it is, it's an, much more likely that the person is going to be engaging. I think my experience is often um, what we do is we quote the law or the complexity of the circumstances back at the customer, which means that it's very hard for that person to engage because it just looks frightening on the page. So I think there's a real obligation for any organisation which says it's customer focused to talk the language that normal people talk um, but I also agree with James. I think um, whether it be health or whether it be tax or whether it be welfare, there is an enormous array of incredibly capable organisations out there um, who will provide support. And I think part of the obligation of organisations like mine is also to be open about signposting people yeah. to those organisations rather than expecting them just to find them for themselves. Okay. Did you have a question related to, to that? Yeah, lovely. We could get the microphone then, please, there. Thank you. Hello. My name's James Allen. Uh, you say you, you think that this um, external advocacy situation in the social services investigation process, there's three levels, and one of them is an external investigator. In my case, there was four different versions of the same report, which was handed to the local council, who then proceeded to amend it by over a page in length to come to the answer that they wanted. So when it went to the judge, the judge then turned around and said it was irrelevant. There was four different versions of the same report, which I actually got through FOI. So there was four different reports in four different departments of the council. It needs something sorting, but being paid for by the council, the person who wrote it felt obliged to give it to the council to have it corrected yeah. to suit you. their needs. Thank you for that. So I think it should be... It's, it's a lot more deeper than just getting somebody outside to do it. Yeah. yeah. I can see lots of nodding. Can I just check, are there any advocacy organisation representatives that wanted to come in there? Yeah, thank you. So I'm Stephanie Linden. I'm the manager for um, the Independent Health Complaints Advocacy Service uh, covering 20 London boroughs. Um, what I can say is that since working for the same service since 2006 now, we have been through uh, quite significant changes during that time. And uh, more prominently, uh, the advocacy services has been, become more fragmented over the last uh, couple of years as contracts have been recommissioned and awarded to different advocacy organisations, which has done nothing to improve the consistency um, across the country of um, independent health complaints advocacy um, and the consistency of quality and standard of service. So um, I come from an era where the independent health complaints advocacy was under the name of ICAS and funded nationally through the Department of Health. Now it's funded independently by each local authority who are free to commission any advocacy service from a big national charity like Power or Voiceability through to um, a very local small advocacy service or local CABs or health watches. That's resulted in an inconsistency of quality and fragmentation. So whilst as advocates we do our best to be able to um, make sure that there's professional advocates providing the service with the national advocacy qualification, 
what's happened over the recommissioning of the service is in fact um, a, a greater patchwork of advocacy provision. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just see, does anyone in the panel want to come, come back on that? Um, well, Bernard. All I would say is we, my committee did a, um, um, an inquiry into the whole complaint handling of government and uh, our report was called More Complaints, Please, mm. because actually the, a really effective organization should want to make any advocacy, external advocacy organization redundant. When you ring up to complain, oh yes, we'll help you make a complaint. We want your complaints, we want your information. You're giving us a gift of some information that may, is an opportunity for us to make our service better. And the problem we have, I mean, you know, it is so striking how overwhelming the, the health question is in this room. Um, as soon as you make a complaint in the health service, it turns adversarial. And you know, even years after we've been working together, James, um, it is still the case. As soon as you say you want to make a complaint, the shutters come down. And the challenge is to change, challenge that culture and turn it on its head. If anybody makes a complaint about airline safety, it's not like that. Mm. Um, uh, immediately, you're, you're treated very seriously. Uh, and what we've been trying to look at is how to transfer that culture into the health service culture. Yeah. Can, can I draw in some, some, some comments on, online there? Because this was at the heart, I think, of Stephen's question as well, which is this, uh, this perception of, of bias. Um, that, that is something which, which has come up previously. Um, James, you introduced yourself as James Allen, but are you Jim Allen, who kind of has posted something online? Do, do you mind me referring to one of your, 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 your posts? Um, so, so Jim James asked the question, why do you side with the department being investigated rather than taking a more holistic view? Interestingly, uh, other comments online, why is the starting point for PHSO always that the NHS is wrong? Why is PHSO still so removed from the reality of NHS care today and challenges complaints teams face, and the challenges, sorry, that complaints teams face in responding to concerns? So two very different interpretations of bias there. Um, Rob, can I come to maybe you first, and again, Angela, kind of your, your thoughts on this, actually, as, as somebody who uses PHSO would be interesting. Rob? Well, I think James and I had a discussion about this this morning on Radio Ombudsman, and he made the point that in order to be effective, case handlers in the Ombudsman office should not be deferential or over-reliant on the reports they receive from bodies in jurisdiction, and they should have a curiosity to look beyond that and to think about it. And there are two elements to that. One is about training, and the other is about a mindset and a culture which encourages people to ask difficult questions and not to be put off by them, and you, you need both of those things. So uh, there is the danger of bias in it, where, where you have bodies and jurisdiction that want to um, uh, give you lots of technical details, which, which is sometimes uh, a defense mechanism. To the person who said, uh, why do we always assume the health service is wrong? You know, with respect, I mean, there's not a shadow of uh, justification for that uh, statement. We end up with 36% of complaints being justified or partly justified, which is considerably more than the OIA. We're going to hear more from them later. But what it means is the vast majority of complaints that we look at from the health service are not considered to be justified or even partly justified. And one of my tasks in the strategic plan is to make sure that we promote the good practice which comes from right across the health service and uh, illuminate that through our uh, transparent approaches rather than just focus on the poor practice. Mm, thank you. Um, Angela. Yeah, I, I think what is um, incredibly challenging in, in a circumstance of any kind of a complaint is that there are humans in it with emotion. And 
as a, whatever is the circumstance, no matter whether you're the person or the organisation being complained about, the person doing the complaining, both people enter into that, often starting with the view that they are right. And therefore, the challenge to be objective um, and be able to drive things based purely on the facts is part of the reason why an independent third party can be incredibly important in some of the really much more complicated and um, challenging complaints. Because no matter how good a person tries to be about being objective about the circumstances, something has happened to them as the person who is complaining, or perhaps, as I say, there's a, a defensiveness in the organisation. I think inside organisations, the real challenge, it does come back to the power and um, what Jim was saying there about people's feelings about, well, I'm being paid by these guys, so I better not, um, I better not say anything bad about them. I think that comes down to the kind of standing instructions and the leadership culture and the confidence about speaking truth into power. Because if you have the right um, remit for your complaints handlers, their job is to get to the truth and play the truth back as a mirror. It isn't to try to work out what blame is, because actually this should be a fact-based discussion. I recognise even, you know, there's various versions of facts, I get that, but it should start with really, you're doing it really well when what I'm doing is just trying to understand what's going on and play it back. And, and I, you know, but the challenge I think through all complicated complaints is depending upon the outcome, somebody is going to feel that it wasn't what they wanted. Um, so there is no really emotion-free outcome in some incredibly complicated and difficult circumstances, depending obviously on the type of complaint. You get less passionate about tax than you do about health service, although I do get some very passionate response about tax. So, uh, yeah. Okay. James, did you want to come only, only to really add that you know, there's a range of different cultures in organisations, and in some organisations they will not try and give misleading information. They'll be very open and honest. And there is another end of the spectrum where some organisations will be defensive. They will be trying to pull the wool over the eyes. And I guess for the ombudsman, that's about being savvy, yeah. recognising that you have to apply kind of the scrutiny to really get under the skin of that and not always take things at face value, but to, to apply a deeper level of um, analysis. Yeah. With that in mind, can I bring in um, Diane there, if you're happy? Because I think Diane has a question that really actually goes to the heart of kind of use of evidence and transparency <coughs> and about me. kind of bringing those facts into things. Diane. Thank you. Hello, yes, Diane McKee, and my me uh, question for the Ombudsman is, as a claimant who has had a bad experience both with the NHS and the Ombudsman, and as someone who worked as a safety audit auditor for an airline where standards are stringent, how do you best practice in mind for staff to follow going forward, plan to place adequate and appropriate pressure on the NHS, given that things either went right or on the day or they didn't, and delays and lack of transparency are only in the interests of those wanting to cover up, cause further harm and distress to families and patients, and cost the NHS money. Okay, thank you for that, Diane. Rob, do you want to start with that? And Amanda, you might want to come in. Could you go to Amanda first? Could you go to Amanda first, okay. sorry. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about the healthcare safety investigation branch and the role that they'll have going forward in relation to <coughs> specific patient safety events. But I think from an ombudsman perspective, our job is to, um, to look at all the evidence um, and to weigh that evidence. And that evidence might be written records that come from a trust, or it might be the testimony of the friends and family that were there. Um, and we have to look at when those two sets of evidence um, conflict, and therefore decide what weight to put on, on those evidence. And um, certainly I've seen in investigation reports um, instances where there has been a conflict that's been unexplained. And so we've gone on to talk about that and why we think that is unexplained. Um, and we can draw inferences and draw conclusions on the basis of those discrepancies. Um, we also have the power when we think that an organisation is purposely withholding evidence um, to take um, court action against them um, to require them to produce evidence if we think that that is an intentional um, withholding of evidence. And also um, to, to look at the quality of the evidence that's produced. So, were the records contemporaneously produced, or do we think that things have been added after the event? Um, 
are the records at the time of the event really sparse, whereas at different points they're very detailed? And what is that? Why and what is the reason for that? So I think we've got a very important role in, in taking that evidence, and we also have the ability to go and interview um, individuals as well if we think that that evidence is not sufficient, and that includes um, members of the family as well um, that were there at the time. Now, we don't do that very often. Um, I think there's much more we can do in that, in that respect um, in terms of weighting evidence. But I, one of the things that Rob mentioned um, that we are doing as part of our new strategic plan is moving towards um, publicising all of our investigation reports online. Um, and that's going to be a very, very different prospect, um, something that the local government and social care ombudsman does already. Um, and what that does is put everything that we find into the public domain, and that's both good and bad. But it will go into a lot of detail about the evidence we find, the evidence we rely on, discrepancies in evidence, quality of the evidence produced. Um, and I think that will cause a, quite a different approach, not only to obviously how we operate um, in the Ombudsman, but also um, with the bodies that we investigate as well, because I think everybody will have to understand that whatever they say and whatever they uh, tell us and whatever evidence we look at will be reflected in the public domain and everybody will have the opportunity to look at that. Okay, I'm gonna come back to Rob, but can I just check, is um, Julie Shorrock here? Julie, because I think you, your question feels related to this about clinical advice. So we'll, we'll come back to you in a moment. But Rob. Um, can I just say that there's no point in hearing <coughs> presentations like James's, him having gone through the trauma of his experience without us all learning from it in a way which changes our practice. And one, one of the things that strikes me about the case, which has went on for far too long in too many cases, was one of the reasons why the Ombudsman decided, together with the predecessor of CQC, not to investigate the case, uh, was not just because of this terrible phrase, no worthwhile outcome, which hopefully is banished forever, but also because papers had gone missing uh, and the decision was made that because the papers had gone missing, we would never actually find out what had happened. Now, what I learned from that is that that is a reason to investigate assertively. It's not a reason to back off mm. as a result of finding that the papers are gone. And one of the things that shocks me, I have to say, is that in too many cases that I am now seeing papers are going missing where there has been a clinical incident. And that is entirely unacceptable. Okay. Um, Rob, thank you for that. Just to reassure you, well, I haven't forgotten Ashley Armstrong, but I think I'm right in saying Ashley, um, <coughs> Ashley left previously. I couldn't remember. Well, we'll come. Maybe we'll kind of come back. Kind of maybe you kind of gathered your thoughts. But I said I'd like to bring in Julie here. Can I just get a show of hands for kind of other questions that kind of people want to raise? Because I do want to kind of make sure I, I, I come to people. So what we'll do is we'll we'll hear from Julie. We'll go back to Ashley Armstrong's kind of question, um, and then we'll kind of start to open things out, and we'll do that in clusters as well. Um, Julie. Okay. My name is Julie Shorrock. Um, I'm the sister of a complainant. Uh, I've also got a personal interest in protection of the elderly. Um, my question is, it, my understanding is that when a death is being investigated, the Ombudsman Clinical Advisor does not speak to anyone involved in the case and solely looks at the complaint correspondence and at medical records to arrive at the Ombudsman's opinion. Is this true? And if so, why do they not speak to the um, experts in the health service? Okay, thank you for that. So I think Amanda would be good to, to hear um, your thoughts on that. Can I just check, is it, is it useful to come back to, forgive me, I don't know where you fit in in relation to Ashley Armstrong, but are, are you comfortable putting the points Ashley Armstrong was going to raise? What, what can I do? 
do you want me to kind of give you a sense of the, the, the key points? Again, it's this theme around use of evidence um, and transparency. So uh, Ashley's question was around, if investigators from PHSO ask a hospital for all of the medical notes in a serious complaint of a patient who is grade four, for precious ores, um, and, and then kind of resulting in sepsis. If a senior consultant uh, knew this, didn't put it on the medical death certificate. So again, it's that, it's that theme of kind of information not coming forward. Um, and, and really, I think the key concern that Ashley was making there was the hospitals are pulling the wool over PHSO's eyes. So again, kind of Rob's, Rob's talked about that. But Amanda, this issue of transparency around clinical advice, which is one of the points that Julie was making, and then broader points of hopefully I've done justice to the kind of key, key concern of Ashley Armstrong. Amanda. Okay, I, I think what's really important to understand is that the Ombudsman investigation is from a lay perspective. Um, it's not from a professional perspective, and it's from a lay perspective specifically so that it can be independent and impartial, um, looking from both the complainant's perspective and the perspective of the trust. Um, and so in order to, again, ensure that the clinical advice that's given is <coughs> equally independent, the, the investigator, the lay investigator, puts to the clinician the um, issues that they would like the clinician to answer. Um, and then they will then take that um, information back from the clinician, and that <coughs> retains the impartiality. And the investigator will be talking to the complainant and understanding from the complainant <coughs> Um, the perspective, and then obviously <coughs> making records and talking to um, to the trust from their perspective as well. Um, and so the idea is that they will take that evidence from the clinician, um, looking at best practice and guidelines and so on that the clinician has examined, um, but also taking the wider weight of evidence um, and informing their, their lay decision. But we do understand, and Rob mentioned this earlier, that um, from... Um, from the perspective of both bodies in jurisdiction and from complainants, that feels like quite an opaque process. Um, and because of that, we've listened to what we've been, uh, we've been told over the past 12 months, um, and we've agreed to do a complete review of um, the way we both seek and use clinical advice um, and the transparency of that advice that's received. So. Um, we will be going out um, over the summer and we will be inviting um, people to participate in focus groups with us to talk to us about how we commission and use clinical advice um, and also um, going out to um, a public consultation later in the year in the autumn again so that we can take everybody's views on the best way to do that and then have um, independent clinical professionals also um, looking at what the best way of doing and using clinical advice going forward will be. Um, so things will change, but I, again, I wanted to just repeat that, that we are a lay investigative service, so it's about taking the information from professionals and then applying our judgment to it. Thank you, Matt. Bernard, I know you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I've, I've watched the Ombudsman for years now, and... It, this is a, a terrible struggle for the Ombudsman because it, it's basically the fire engine that comes in at the end of the complaints process after everything's gone wrong and the complaint's been mishandled and then it's trying to find out what happened years ago. And, and this is why uh, James is so right that we need an incident investigation capability in the NHS that naturally assembles all this information. So if there is a complaint, all this information is available. So many people have already come up to me today to complain that there's been a cover-up, the Ombudsman hasn't been told the truth, the Ombudsman's got it wrong, um, there's corruption, there's lying. Um, and I so understand this because we've got a system. One of the reasons why the HSIB is going to be so important, once we've got the legislation, there is nowhere for anybody to go in the health service to tell the truth without fear of being punished for the truth that they tell. There's nowhere to go. There's no legal protection, nowhere. And one of the big arguments about setting up HCIM, like the air accident investigation branch of the Department of Transport, is the pilots can ring somebody up and say, I've just seen something that I think is really wrong, or we'll be sitting next to another pilot and be saying, I don't like the way you landed that aeroplane. I think we should talk to the air accident investigation people about this landing. And they'll just do it. 
because there's no prosecution. There's no, I mean, obviously, if somebody's willfully stupid, they're going to get prosecuted. Um, but the point is, there is that safe space to have the conversation. And we've just seen, we've, at the moment, we've got this dreadful tension between the, the health secretary wanted this duty of candor. Now, this is another fear of punishment being put into the medical profession. You've got to be candid. You've got to tell the truth. But then there's a paediatrician that told the truth about a baby that died in her care. And she did all the right things. And she's been struck off. And, um, and there's a lot of clinicians who are saying, hang on just a minute, you can't do this. She told the truth to try and make things better. And she's been punished for it. So that's why the Ombudsman is struggling with a fundamentally flawed system and why the HCIB is an absolutely essential new component that will make the whole thing much more rational for people in the system. And, and just to confirm, there's a lot of agreement coming in online there in terms of, again, just that emphasis on balance, that emphasis on transparency and saying that transparency works against NHS organisations. Lack of transparency works against NHS organisations just as it works against individual complainants. I want to hear from others. I know you want to kind of come in there, James, but I kind of want to bring others in. Can I get a show of hands and then we're going to start clustering? Um, so... We've got some microphones, so can we go uh, in the front? If you could just keep your hands up, just so I can just kind of group them, and then I'll come back. So let's just go over this side. So we've got one, two, three, and four. So if you can get the microphone along there, and then if we pass it along the line, and then if you can give your microphone to the person with their hand up there, thank you, then we'll come <coughs> to you. Um, yes, yeah, so as I say, if you could keep your questions quite prompt, because I want to kind of take a cluster and get some responses. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wendy from Guys and St Thomas's, and I think... Listening to the panel on balance, I've worked in complaints for 11 years, and we've always strove in all the organisations I've worked in to be transparent and to be fair, and even though we are paid by the organisations that we work in, to find the best outcome and answers and to learn from them. And I think there's a lot of negativity here towards some of the organisations and towards the Ombudsman, and on balance I've had some very good experiences with the Ombudsman over the years, and some not so very good. I think we welcome the new strategy, we welcome improvements, and we welcome openness in review of the process. And really, um, I've almost forgot my own question from having a moment there. Really, um, I think people should be open and complainants should be very open about the process as they go through and be more open about what they want from organisations and from the Ombudsman going forward so we can all work better together to get the best outcome, as honest and blame-free as that can be, so we can go forward to learn more. Thank you very much for that, Wendy. Do you want to pass your microphone along? Aidan McDonnell from Kentish Town. Um, Rob made an interesting point earlier saying that um, the organisation, the Ombudsman's Office, is not, it's not a people's champion, but of course um, investigations are to be conducted fairly as far as, far as possible. In my particular case, the chief executive of the London Ambulance Service in 2016 said that the, um, the delays in getting my brother to hospital was very poor and gave me a choice of either getting a, an assessment from a stroke specialist into the case or going to the Ombudsman's office. I wanted an independent investigation to be done and obviously chose our office here and the, the um, case was found to be a, a complaint that was not upheld. Now um, I've uh, asked that a stroke specialist to be, con to be um, consulted and, and even suggested that I'd be prepared to pay for that but again that was uh, discounted in the, in the process. I believe it's now gone on to the final stage whereby another case officer is going to review it. But all I'm, the key point that I want to raise today was that we asked that in disputes resolutions, I think it's always good to have an independent third clinical, as clinical expertise to be able to consult us, such as a stroke expert, yeah. to make a final determination. And I think that's useful for resolving disputes, okay. especially if there's a contentious report at yeah, hand. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Aidan. Can we hear from the back and also then kind of we'll hand the microphone uh, down in the, in the middle there. So yes, if, if you go ahead. Later, Hello, mic. my name is Samia Mudether. I'm a complaints officer at the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. Can't and I just wanted to make a few points, which is that often 
with complaints. It's people because people don't understand how things work, and um, it's the frustration with that. Can you put your microphone uh, a little bit closer. That that might help. Thank you. It, I said um, people obviously, obviously complain quite a lot in our department because they don't understand the way the system works, and the complaint really is a resolution of their understanding. Um, and I think also, um, at the beginning, uh, advocacy, advocacy services are quite helpful, but I think at the beginning, people need to have that explained to them directly, and it would stop complaints having to escalate needlessly. And also, complaint resolution, when it reaches a PHSO, it's always retrospective, and it would be really good if things could be sorted or nipped in the bud at the beginning. Okay. And learning is not going to be repeated because situations are always changing. Um, also, there's a problem to do with policy and the way things are structured. So if the customer is really the center of um, uh, services, they should be listened to at the beginning and transparently um, addressed and their issues um, uh, cl clearly addressed then, okay. not having Thank been you. through the system, mm -hmm. complain, and then for different complaints around something to happen. Thank you very much for that. What I'm going to take away from that as the panel, I think, is some quite key points there around expectation management and earlier resolution. Um, and can we just pass the microphone down to the right kind of person with the, the lanyard kind of here? Thank you. It's not often you get to use the word lanyard, is it? So, uh, there you go. Final question, then we'll come back Thank to you. the panel. Um, it's a bit of a diff different one, really, from what we've had before. Um, I work for the Department for Education, and um, we, um, on the team I work, and we get complaints from parents uh, or, or, or people who live near academies, because I work on the academy side, where the parents, they, they can only really go to the academy themselves if they're unhappy with them, and the academy investigates. Um, if the parent or complaint is unhappy, they then come to us as the Department for Education, but we can't actually look at the outcome of the decision, we can look at the way the case is handled. Um, and so we then get um, parents writing to us unhappy with the outcome, but all we can say is, well, the school's complied with their uh, complaints procedure and it's, it's compliant with uh, the Secretary of State, so we can't do anything. And then it just kind of snowballs and, pardon the expression, but the parent becomes more pissed off with us than the actual school itself because we can't do anything. Um, and obviously as more academies are being rolled out, this is becoming more and more of a problem. Um, and then the next stage is they can, they can go through the, the informal and then the stage one, stage two, and then it comes to the PHSO. Um, but again, nobody's actually investigating at the school what's happening, because obviously it's quite an emotive subject with it being uh, somebody's ch child. Uh, we do have safeguarding procedures in place, but um, I mean, the school's meant to have somebody independent, but we do not investigate that, so it is quite a, quite a problem that we're facing. Okay, thank you for that. So, so maybe there's a challenge there around, again, that eligibility criteria, isn't it? It's kind of almost what you're allowed to scope and what you're allowed to bring in. Um, can we start with you maybe, Rob, and then I'll kind of be led by other panel members. But as I say, you've heard there around kind of the importance of kind of independence advice, expectation management, earlier resolution, and challenges around eligibility. Okay, I'll make two points. Please do. First of all, on the, the person who raised the issue about what clinical advice we use, mm -hmm. or rather what clinicians we use. This is absolutely at the heart of our review, mm -hmm. and we will look at that very carefully, because I have heard complaints from the Patients Association that sometimes we have used clinicians who don't have an expertise in the area that is, is being looked at, and that, sh that is inappropriate. We shouldn't have that. On the gentleman's question about um, uh, ombudsman going into schools. I mean, my goodness me, this is a great question for politicians because it seems to me that, uh, and, and my colleague will correct me, but there was a pilot uh, undertaken by the local government ombudsman to look at uh, complaints against schools. It was a perfectly uh, rigorous and successful pilot, pilot uh, and the recommendation was that it should be incorporated into the local government ombudsman's role and there was a political veto that stopped that from happening and so what we have is a hole, a lacuna, a, a big gap in jurisdiction because politicians uh, of whatever party don't want those cases to be looked at. 
And I can do precisely nothing about that because that's a legislative question. It's not a, a question of, of how my scheme operates. Thank you, Rob. Bernard, do you want to come well, in I'm just, I'm, I was fascinated. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by this. I've got an academy trust in my own constituency, which is um, now subject to an investigation um, from Ofsted. And you've got a unit in your department that is now looking at the governance of academy trusts. Um, uh, but this is a real accountability hole. Um, when schools were more accountable to local authorities, it was a bit easier. Um, I don't envy your position, and thank you very much for coming along and airing it. I think you'll find you've got willing ministers who are alive to this problem. But, I mean, it hadn't occurred to me that actually when we come to review the draft legislation for the new unified ombudsman, we should actually look at uh, the, the place for education in this because it is, as you say, it's rather odd that you can complain to the ombudsman. About, about, but it does depend upon what complaints procedures you've got and how effective they are first because you need that for, because you can't expect the ombudsman to come cleaning up um, at, if there are thousands and thousands of cases as we're finding with the health service. Nobody will be able to hear you because you haven't got a microphone. So no. if you want to kind of come back in very briefly, though. Yeah, you thank mind. you. I'll keep it brief. And um, we can only investigate whether or not the complaints procedure has been followed correctly by the school, and that, that complaints procedure is meets the regulations in accordance with the agreement between the Secretary of State and the Academy for the, you know, the, for the, um, for the funding agreement. So we don't actually look and see what's actually happened. Um, and so the parent is saying, well, I'm getting nowhere with it. And, we're, and we're, all we're doing is referring them back to the school and saying we've not followed the correct procedure, or if they have, we say, well, we can't do anything. We can't look at the outcome. We can only look at the way the case is handled, and it's just creating a problem. So we do have the informal and form, uh, formal stage one and formal stage two. So we do have ways for the parents to come back to us after that. But again, we can look at the case handling, not the outcome. So the parent is getting nowhere, and they're absolutely, they become a bat it becomes a battle with us and the parent rather than us actually helping them. And Which we is unfair just, on you and unfair on them. Exactly, I exactly. Want, I'll leave that one with you. Bring, thank you. <laughs> thank I'm you. recognising some of the challenges are in statute, aren't they, in, in, in some instances. I want to just kind of bring in some, some other points. I saw Amanda wanted to come in there. Um, Angela, I'm really interested in hearing your points as well, because I know you, you've talked about previously about this once and done approach. So when yes. it comes to kind of earlier resolution and kind of yep. resolving things nice and early on. But Amanda, did you want to come in there? Yeah, well, partly it's, it's on that point. Um, I can remember going to talk to a group of um, government complaint handlers um, about a year ago and um, talk to them about um, the most um, recommended remedy that comes out of our investigations um, in, in government complaints. Um, and by far the top remedy that we recommend is for the organisation to say sorry. And what I said to them is, why does it take an ombudsman investigation to ask you to say sorry? And it's say sorry is first and foremost, and then fix it so it doesn't happen to somebody else um, is the second thing. And, and really, it's to the point that Angela's been making. It shouldn't need to go through an entire system and for an individual to have to go through weeks and months of angst and to come to us and have a full investigation to end up with an apology and, and an undertaking not, not to do it again. Um, so I think there is, you know, there is much more, more to do. Um, but on, on the second bit, which was about also how can we make things, um, <coughs> how can we resolve it earlier? We've talked about early um, an alternative dispute resolution. And one of the um, areas that we are working on at the moment is, is looking with NHS resolution as to what more we can do together to help people to not have to go through a legislative process. So when there are cases which um, come to us where um, there is a sort of prima facie evidence of, um, of negligence. Um, is there a mechanism for us to refer people straight to NHS resolution to have their case mediated rather than to sort of push them towards the courts so that they then have to get um, legal advice um, and go through a very protracted <coughs> procedure um, to then come back in um, and obviously cost much more money to, to the health system? Um, so we've, we've come to an agreement with NHS Resolution that we will start to look at a very small number of cases to see whether we can make those direct referrals into NHS Resolution to save the system um, a lot of time and money, but also to save the individual the angst of having to 
um, be pushed back through a, a court process. So again, a new way of thinking about how we can resolve things more quickly for everybody um, involved. I'm going to come back to Angela and James, but I just want to see a show of hands and, and get a sense of questions. Um, and just with that point in mind, Amanda, um, online, one of the themes is a question about lack of clarity around the relationship between PHSO and other regulators, HSIB, and that general sense of understanding kind of how everyone fits into that bigger system of patient safety or indeed quality improvement. So just to share that, let me just get a sense of hands because time's going to beat us. So if we can just get microphones ready kind of over this side and we'll kind of take three or four very, very quickly. Um, but Angela and James, any points yeah. based on what I think that the I think the, the challenge the, the lady up there was making the point about communication. I think um, as government services, we talk officialdom to the citizens of the UK. Um, and um, if we were selling our services, probably somebody would have gone off now and, and gone with the provider who was managing to explain some of this stuff in a way that was much more accessible. Um, I think there is a real challenge for all organisations. There is lots of enormous complexity in everything from housing to health to tax to welfare. These are enormously complicated because they have to cater for 50 million citizens in the UK. But actually, a really skilled organisation doesn't put that complication and make it the job of the citizen to actually understand what we're talking about. And I think that we're spending a lot of time in many government organisations dealing with the consequences of the fact that the customer doesn't understand what we're talking about, as opposed to investing up front. And actually, we think that we've done that by going online, but often what we've done is put the gobbledygook online, so it's still digital gobbledygook. And I think that there is a, our skill and ability to communicate effectively in language that anybody could understand um, is actually one of the things that, as government, I know we're trying to step up, but I think there's an awful lot more to go on every topic. As I say, from tax to health to welfare, um, there's a lot more to do. Thank you very much, Angela. James has indicated he's, he's happy that, that we go back out to questions. So can we have microphones, please? So can we have a microphone? Cut, so we've got okay. there, and then if it can come down here, and then at the back there, we, we'll do those three. Thank you. As if you could keep your points nice and brief, we're in our final five minutes. I'm Sally Tabor, um, Director of the Independent Sector Complaints Adjudication Service for private patients, and we operate in four countries. The Welsh Ombudsman is just about to have his powers extended so he can deal with complaints across the NHS and the independent sector. Will that follow in England? Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's have the microphone then here. Um, thank you. Um, I agree very much with what James said, thank you, um, that the greatest shock for me was not the death of my father and the tragedy, but the way that my complaint was handled, particularly by the Ombudsman, and um, I appreciate that the Ombudsman has admitted that in the past things have not been as they should be. I am stuck in that system. My case has now become historic. Um, I've, the only thing I've been able to do is go to PHSO The Facts, which I recommend highly. Um, who, there are many people who've shared my experiences. Um, and I don't know what I am to do. The Ombudsman won't look at my case because it's become <coughs> now historic, not through my own fault. <coughs> it took a year. Um, and they won't look at it from the start to the end point, so they don't have an understanding of what happened. Yeah. I am hitting a brick wall, and I feel that the Ombudsman is a brick wall dressed up as democracy. I would love to believe that it's not, but that is how it feels to me. Okay, Okay. thank you. We will pick up on that. Um, I can literally only take two more. So we've got the lady with the microphone okay. there, and then I've been promising you. And I'm, I'm sorry that time can has you been this, which we knew it would. Yes, we it's can hear it. Okay. Um, my name is Brenda Prentice, and I also belong to PHSO, thefacts.com. We are hoping for changes. Um, I would like to say that many years ago, I said to Dame Julie, we don't need lay caseworkers, the very least qualification caseworkers should have is a degree in law since all services are grounded basically in legislation. I'd like to say to the lady who said what do we want, simply just the truth, just that's all we want to know. It's when we don't get the truth that we would take out um, negligence cases. Okay. 
Thank you. What I'd also like to say is I've been coming to these places for years and all we've had is hot air. We don't see much in the way of progress. It's always jam tomorrow. Please, could we have some jam today? And for people with historic cases, could we have some jam for yesterday too, please? Okay, thank you for that, Brenda. And final question, comment from the person here. Thank you. Uh, my name's Lynn Peet. I'm Sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, my name's Lynn Peet. Thank you, Lynn. I'm a complainant on behalf of my husband who okay. died while in hospital. Uh, my question is, Following apologies and promises of changes and corrective actions being implemented by a trust, is this followed up by an audit yeah. to ensure that changes are actually made? And does the PHSO investigative team ensure that they are in place? Because if they're not in place, should the complainant and the PHSO have been misled? Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Lynn. Can I ask, Amanda, can you pick up on... Um, Welsh Ombudsman, kind of where independent uh, sector fits in, and this issue of kind of training and accreditation of um, caseworkers as briefly as you can. Rob, can I leave you with um, historic cases and this very valid point about kind of compliance audit, kind of following up on, on our recommendations. So Amanda. Um, so we've talked today about the wish for a new um, public Ombudsman um, bill and that bill, um, we sought a number of different and extra powers um, within that. And there are other things that we would like that are not currently in there that we are talking to, um, to government ministers about um, as well. Because at the moment, of course, that we can investigate um, health care provided by private companies, but that commissioned um, through NHS providers, but not um, from those that are, that are just simply uh, private sector provision and yeah. private sector commissioned as well. Um, in relation to um, the, sorry, what was well, the it's other? It's a training. So Brenda oh, was training. raising this issue of whether people need to be legally qualified, but there's a yeah. broader issue there around training of caseworkers. There is. There? In fact, very many of our um, uh, caseworkers are legally qualified, um, but we are a lay service, so it's not a requirement that they have legal qualifications because um, we are not investigating um, legal cases. We're investigating as, as lay investigators. Um, but the training... All services are grounded within legislation. They don't do it out of the goodness of their heart. And, and that is the fact for um, a lot of investigations. Obviously, police investigations are applying the law, but it doesn't mean you have to be legally qualified to be a police officer. Um, that is the nature of, this, of, of the investigative capabilities across a range of, um, of organisations in this country. Um, what we are trying to do is to set a standard for... Um, how cases will be investigated, and that's the casework um, development training that I talked about in my presentation earlier. Um, we've, we've gone through one complete set of training for all caseworkers over the last few months in PHSO, and we've now developed a more in-depth uh, training course, which we will put every caseworker and all of their managers through um, over the course of the summer period. So um, we have also been developing a set of standards and we will be measuring um, how our caseworkers perform against those standards and um, accrediting those uh, caseworkers to have the delegated authority to make decisions on the basis of reaching those standards. So um, this is something that's not been done before in the Ombudsman community anywhere that we know about. Um, and we've been working really hard over the past 12 months to develop uh, this new casework development training um, and many others are looking at it and looking and seeing what we're doing with a view to potentially using it as well so um, I appreciate the, the jam tomorrow but you need to create these things if they don't exist and that's what we've been doing over the last 12 months is creating something really groundbreaking and new. Thank you for that Amanda. I'm going to hand over to Rob. Rob these will be your final comments because I'm very mindful of, of time so historic cases and this issue of compliance and audit. All right, four points. Mm. They better be four brief points, Rob. First of all, what I've heard people say is that we need to get our communication, and particularly our written communication, uh, appropriate. Um, I heard the phrase managing expectations. This is the Keena Doran point. She says to me, as a number of others do, it's patronising to be told that you, you're... 
Absolutely, that's fine too, but we, we've got to get away from that, we've got to get away from no, no worthwhile outcomes. And we're looking seriously at that, that's the first point. Second point is that we have actually used the Behavioural Insights team to independently review how we communicate, uh, giving us independent external advice about how to do it better, and, and we will use that uh, to go forward. Um, as far as um, uh, the point about ombudsmen needing to be lawyers, I reject that entirely. That. Well, it's suggested to me that you did. Uh, the point is that the point is that ombudsmen are not second-hand lawyers or even third-hand lawyers. <coughs> ombudsmen are different. The key challenge is to be able to resolve complaints without using lawyers. That's why ombudsmen were created. And that's why... That, well, I, I, I respectfully disagree with you. What I'm saying... What, well, you, you can, with pleasure, ask it. But my point is, we should be using all the resources available to an ombudsman, mediation, early resolution, as a way of talking to people without them having to use lawyers. And if they use lawyers, then I respectfully accept that, in part, we will have failed as a result. My final point is this. I do not accept that the Ombudsman Service is a brick wall dressed up as democracy. The point about historic cases is that we should always be willing to review a case as the Ombudsman of last resort. But there will come a point, and I'm not talking about the case that you're raising, there will come a point when the Ombudsman has to decide whether or not there is legitimacy in the case, and it's for us to make the decision and for you to make the complaint. And if you don't like that, then you have the opportunity to bring a judicial review. That's what the law says, and that's the way it is. And we must get away from continually promising people that we will reinvestigate because that doesn't help anybody. And that's why we've got rid of the principle of external independent review. Okay. Can I just uh, say point 43 of the um, customer services. Brenda, have you got, no have you got a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Point uh, 43 of the customer services charter or is it guidelines say there is no one that can review our decision. That includes a JR. Well, that's simply a, a misinterpretation of, of the reality of the case. You have okay. misunderstood what it is we're okay. saying. All, I am so sorry, because as is inevitably the case, isn't it, and all of us, let's face it, have been at the Q&A sessions before, as is inevitably the case, it's at the point at which we kind of, it sometimes feels like you're getting to the heart of some key and contested issues, time has beaten us, for which I am very sorry, but I kind of have, have I, I can't, I have no control over the kind of hands of time, as it were, in terms of, and I do need to let people get onto their breakout sessions. Um, what I would say is those breakout sessions are an opportunity to carry on these conversations. Um, so just because the Q&A part of this day is coming to an end, it does not mean, and indeed it should not mean, that those discussions do not continue. But just with that in mind, we do need to bring things to a close. Bernard, can I put you on the spot and say, what are you going to take back to the House from what you've heard today? Well, um, uh, in our original report that recommended the HSIB, the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch, and this will pick up one or two of the points that have been made, um, uh, we recommended that a big part of its role will be training of clinical incident investigators for, throughout the health service. There should be a new profession. There should be new examinations and courses for people to learn how to do proper investigations. The point that James made uh, very powerfully. So we want that to go in the bill that isn't in the bill at the moment. Secondly, um, it's essential that this HSIB should cover the private sector. I mean, you, ca you can't insulate the private sector from oversight, and there, there are patients that might be treated in the health service but in a private sector setting, or they might come from the private sector into the health service when something goes wrong. You need to be able to investigate the private sector. So that will go into the bill. Audit and follow-up, absolutely essential. Yeah. Um, one of the things my committee does is we take reports 
that are presented to us, presented to Parliament by the Ombudsman, and it wasn't done before, we now do it, we have a follow-up hearing to put the people on the spot. Sepsis was a big one. Yeah. And we, we had the um, um, Health Improvement and the Care Quality Commission and various other bodies in front of us, and saying, what have you done? And they had done very little. The, the, we had the Nursing and Midwifery <coughs> Council in front of us and ministers explaining why they hadn't changed the outdated regulation for the nursing and midwifery okay. people. Um, and so it, there is follow-up, and it's crucial that the, the HSIB should have the power to ensure that its learning is disseminated. During our original investigation into accident investigation, we found that there were accidents that happened 10 years ago, and investigators found exactly the same thing going wrong again. And let's face it, most people who complain and there are many people in this room, when you first started to complain, you didn't want to complain, you just wanted to, your main motive was to make sure the same dreadful thing didn't happen again. Okay. And when you were pushed back, that was when it all went so bad. Okay. And, and so we need a system that learns from the incidents, disseminates the learning, to make sure the same things don't happen again. And that's why this new body we're setting up, with James's help, with Rob's help, is so important. And then the Ombudsman will have a manageable task. Okay. At the moment, the Ombudsman has an unmanageable task, which is why there are so many unhappy customers in the room today. And thank you for coming to give us your unhappiness, because it's people like you who have stuck it out and carried on talking about your experiences that has led to this change. If it hadn't been for people like you, I would never have got my committee interested in this subject okay. and got this legislation coming forward and got the government to change its mind. So thank you very much. It's been, that's what I take away from thank this. Bernard, Renewed thank motivation. You. Thank you. Bernard, thank you very much. Can you all please join me in thanking Bernard, Amanda, Angela, David. <laughs>